church. We started last week a new series that we called The Church. And since we're, we're doing church, it's important that we understand some elements about that. You see, the church has been the church for more than 2,000 years. And during that period of time, during that long length of time, there have been a lot of different changes that have taken place within the church. We kind of talked a little bit about that last week. You know, we gone from, the, as far as the church, gone from no buildings to having buildings. And we went, there was a time that there were no Christian songs at all. And now today we have lots and lots of Christian songs. There was a time that there was no New Testament. And today we have a full 27 book New Testament that we have. And so we continually see things develop. There was a time in the church that, that the teaching was kind of really basic. It was just kind of the teachings, you know, stories of Jesus and the apostles teaching or whatever. But today we are the benefit of a, of a, a, a systematic theology that we can kind of put things in groups and categories. And we know so much um, that, that many times people didn't. And so the church has um, experienced uh, phenomenal um, blessings and growth throughout the, the, the years. And when you think about it, the church is a living body. We are the body of Christ. And so it would be natural as a body that we would develop over time, over years. I mean, just like your body, just like my body, we develop over years. We didn't stay a little infant. We grew. Same thing with, with the church. In fact, a great verse that talks about it. In fact, we've named our children's ministry, Kids to 252 Kids. Uh, and you wonder where we get that from. We get it from Luke chapter 2, verses, uh, verse 52. And the verse says this, And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature, and in favor with God and man. And so here, that's kind of phenomenal. Jesus and his humanity increased. Jesus changed. He grew. And so if we are the body of Christ, then you would expect that we would also be like Jesus, that the church would grow and, and develop. And over the t uh, time period, the church has done so. And that's normal, that's natural. And yet, there are certain, what we'll call foundational truths, realities, that remain constant. They never change. These are kind of what we call immutable truths that remain consistent no matter how long the church exists, and, and they never change. And we've been looking in this series at certain of these truths that never change. Last week, we talked about one of the first ones, and we talked about authority. And we saw that all authority comes from God above. There, in fact, there is no authority on earth apart from God. And what God has chosen to do is God has chosen to, to give areas of authority that he delegates to certain groups or, or individuals. And so if, the, if anybody has authority... Ultimately, it comes from God, whether we're talking about government, whether we're talking about the, the, the family home, whether we're talking about the church, it all comes from God, and uh, God puts those things into place. Now, today we're going to talk about another element uh, that's, that's unchangeable and in regards to the church, and we're going to talk about church leadership, church leadership. Um, the church uses a lot, and depending on where you come from, churches use a lot of different terminology to talk about leaders, and it can be confusing. And, you know, churches talk about bishops or pastors or priests or a father or a monsignor or elders or deacons or, or reverend or vicar, okay? There are lots of different terminologies there, and so sometimes it's like, well, you know, who are these guys and, and, and what does it mean and why, you know, why don't we have this or why do we have this? And so what I want to do in this morning's message is kind of look at church leadership from, from the Bible and understand what is church leadership, who uh, God has called into the leadership position, how is it supposed to work, and, and how do we respond to that? What are we called to, to do? Fortunately, as you go to the New Testament, God's not made it all that complicated. He's kind of made it simple. And in the New Testament church, there are really only two offices or two positions within the church. Okay? Uh, that would be pastors 
and deacons. God kind of makes it very simple. Now, pastors are the primary leadership within, within the church. We, we look at them as clergy because of the unique calling and, and ministry opportunities. And deacons, their primary task is to support the pastors. And they're, they're laymen. They're just, they're just church members that have been put in this position. And throughout the scripture, um, we're given the, the qualifications for that. And we won't have time to go into all of this. It's pretty elaborate. But primarily, if you look in, in 1 Timothy ch- chapter 3, 1 Timothy chapter 3 or Titus chapter 1, you'll see that God gives the qualifications for that role. And they're mostly character qualities. In other words, not so much what you do, but who you are, because God realizes that who that person is is ultimately more important than, than what they can do. Because if you're not the right person, you're not right with God, then you're not going to probably do those things. And so as you look through those qualifications and you read through it, you'll see certain things kind of stand out as far as what that person should be. And one of the things that we see here is this role is a very complementarian in its position. We believe that the complementarian position is the right one. That is that leadership in that regard uh, goes to qualified men within the church. And, and we believe this not because we are just, you know, this is what we chose to believe. This is what God has put forth. And we have to understand that God sometimes puts forth certain things because he's God. In other words, like last week, he has the authority. So why can God do this? Because he's God. And why did God do it? I don't know. But God did this. And so we're just, you know, yes, sir. You know, we just, we, we go with it. I'll, I'll give you a great example of this. In the Old Testament, the Old Testament priesthood was defined by God as far as those who ministered in the temple and offered the sacrifices. And God made it very specific and limited it to the role of only those people who came out of the tribe of Levi could serve as priest. Okay? If you were born in any of the other tribes, you could never serve as a priest. It didn't matter how godly you were. It didn't matter how hard you studied. It didn't matter your passion for it. You, you couldn't serve. You say, well, that's not fair because I, you know, I was born in Judah or I was born in you know, an, uh, another tribe or whatever. Um, God says, if you're not of that, you can't serve as a priest. And so there are certain things that God sets up that God just says, this is how it is. And it doesn't matter about your qualifications or who you are. This is how it's going to be. So within the church, God calls certain individuals, certain men to these roles of leadership. Um, and we find that as we kind of relate it to the Baptist church and stuff, we understand that, the, that those leaders of, uh, need to be those that have a call from God. In other words, they don't just decide they want to do this because it looks really cool and neat, but that God specifically has reached out to them. Usually in, in, in our churches, we require them to have some kind of a theological degree and, of course, to go through the, the process of, of official ordination. And so there's a lot uh, that goes through that process to, for, for leadership that we have here. Um, in the New Testament, there are different titles that we see if you read through the Bible. And you might think these are different people, but they're all the same. There's all the same office. They're just descriptive terms of the same position. And sometimes for the same position, they're called uh, a pastor, okay? Because that refers to the 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 shepherding quality that's supposed to be in that leadership that they that they feed and they lead the flock and we're going to look at that a little bit more in just a few moments Uh, sometimes they're called bishop okay I know usually in the Baptist church we don't use that term bishop very much but it is in your King James Bible so it's there and it speaks of someone that's an overseer okay someone that oversees uh, what's going on and, and it influences leadership in that regard. Um, then you see uh, another term used, elder. An elder is not referring to your physical age, but it's talking about your spiritual maturity. And so it refers to someone who's in a leadership position that has spiritual maturity. And then sometimes it calls them a minister. And minister speaks of serving, a servant, someone there that is serving. And, of course, we see that embodied 
uh, in the Lord Jesus in so, so many different ways. So, a lot to to deal with, but for our purposes this morning, we're going to hone in on one passage of Scripture that I think gives us some good insights. And so, if you would, turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 5. It's towards the end of the New Testament, 1 Peter chapter 5. And as as, as you begin to turn there, we're going to look at several verses here that um, explain the role of leadership. And we'll begin 1 Peter 5 in verse 1. Peter writes, The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. There's a lot in this chapter, so uh, hang on as we go through this. Peter now begins to address the pastors, the elders that are in Asia Minor. And let me give you some background on this because I think this is important in, in understanding. Um, the, ch- the, the churches in this area have received a lot of persecution because of their faith. And so many of these believers, wherever they were originally from, have relocated to different areas. They're kind of scattered abroad. And the pastors that are ministering to these people are ministering to people that are under a lot of stress and under a lot of tension. They're, they're facing a lot of difficulties. They're facing a lot of trouble as people are trying to um, attack them, are trying to destroy their faith. And so um, Peter's trying to encourage these guys, these men that are out there trying to pastor people that are in a difficult situation. So keep that in mind. Whenever you're reading through a chapter in the, in the scriptures, okay, don't just read through the chapter. Understand the context in which the, the text was written. Don't remove it from the context of it because you're going to miss out some of the, the, the meaning behind what he's saying. And as we understand, as we take in and we read the words of Peter with the understanding that these people are under persecution, these people have been relocated, these people are facing hardships, and we kind of read that into the text that he says, it gives us a different nuance of what he is meaning as, as he writes this here. So in this passage, in this first verse, he begins to exhort. He's, he's trying to urge the pastors that are there, the elders that are ministering there, to, to, to rise above the struggles. Because here's what we understand. When times are hard, understand this, when it's times are hard, isn't it easy to not be mature? Or kind of put it a different way, when times are hard, isn't it hard to be mature? Right, Because when times are difficult, we, we think we have a lot of leverage to make excuses, right? Well, times are hard. What do you expect me to do, right? Things aren't easy, so how do you expect me to feel? Well, listen, buddy, your attitude stinks. Well, look at what's around me. How could I not have a bad attitude? So it's real easy to, to cop out on that. It's real easy to make excuses when things are hard. Now, when things are good, you know, church is growing and there's visitors and there's full attendance and the offerings are good and lots of people are coming and exciting. It's, it's easy to have a good attitude. But when things are stressful, when things are not the way they should be, and when things aren't the way you like it, and you're not getting what you think you ought to be getting, and you're kind of disappointed in things or whatever, it is super, super easy for us to just have a really um, immature attitude. And we become very childish because maturity isn't about what you know. We kind of think maturity is, well, I'm mature because I can quote these Bible verses or because I'm right on these doctrines. And that's part of it, but maturity really is evidence in the way that you apply those truths and, and how grown up you are in your actions. How, how forgiving are you? How patient are you? How, how determined are you? How, how you know, kind are you? Those are the things that are important. Because you see, the test of our maturity, the test of yours and my spiritual maturity is what do you do when times are difficult? When things are difficult, what do you do? 
When things are difficult, do you back off and you say, well, I don't have time for that. I'm sorry, I don't want to do that. No, I won't do that. Or when things are difficult, do you kind of push forward? And so Peter's taking these guys, and it would be real easy for them to kind of back away. And he's saying, listen, I don't want you to back away. I want you to fully engage at this moment, even though you don't feel like you ought to engage. He goes on, verse 2, and we'll look at just the first section there at first he says feed the flock of God which is among you and we're going to continue the verse but there's so much in that feed the flock of God that's among you here's the duty elders here's the duty pastor that I want you to do here's the thing that I want you to do most I want you to feed the flock of God that's among you I want you to give them nourishment all living things need nourishment if you're going to be healthy, right? All the living things. Your lawn needs nourishment. Your pet needs nourishment. You need nourishment. The church of God is no excuse. The church of God needs to be fed. And, and we're not talking about uh, chicken dinners and things of that nature. Okay, we're talking about the, the, the Word of God. Jesus made it very clear in Luke chapter 4 and verse 4. Jesus said this, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. He takes physical food and he says, You're going to die without physical food. You need physical food. But the same is true. You need spiritual food. And the spiritual food you need is the word of God. And that's why the Apostle Paul would later tell the young minister uh, Timothy, in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 2, he would command them this. He said, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Timothy, what should you do? I want you to preach the word. I want you to do it in season, out of season. I want you to do it when they're like, yeah, preach it, preacher. And I want you to do it when they're like, no, 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 preacher. God, I want you to give them the word. And so the primary duty of, of the elders, of the pastors of the church, okay, is, is, and, and in addition to everything else they may do, the primary thing is I want you to make sure you feed the flock of God. Now notice that he calls it, he calls the church the flock of God. Now what is a flock here? It, it's a group of sheep, right? Now this isn't, this isn't really flattering, okay? Okay, this is not real complimentary to us, okay? But he calls us sheep. And yes, that was a term that Jesus used a lot of times, as Jesus would later say, I'm the great shepherd. And so he would call them sheep. Now, now think about sheep, okay? Now notice you're not as cute as those sheep, okay? But, uh, but you are sheep according to Jesus. Think about sheep. Okay? Sheep were not made to live apart from the flock, Okay. Sheep were made to be together. You don't see sheep just, you know, wandering around doing their own things. Well, if you do, they don't live very long because a predator will usually get, get them. You know, you don't usually see people just, you know, sheep. They're usually in groups. They're, they're flocks of sheep that are there. You don't go out and you see, well, here's the shepherd and I got one sheep. You know, no. Now, the, the, the sheep were made to be in a flock. You and I, as the church, we were made to be together. Because again, we're sheep, but we're also a body. Okay? We also see that sheep need a shepherd. Okay? Sheep aren't to be uh, independent on their own. You don't just see sheep and say, where's your shepherd? Oh, we don't need one. Okay? Uh, whenever you see a flock of sheep, there's a shepherd associated with them because sheep need someone to lead them. Okay? And he, Peter makes it very descriptive. It is the flock of who? God. Okay, they're gods. They're they're not the shepherd. They're not the under shepherd's sheep. They're God's sheep. And so he says, "Listen, I want you to feed these sheep that belong to God. They are they are part of God's family. They're part of God's um, people. But I want you. Your responsibility is to feed that." flock and of course in a spiritual sense I want you to feed them with the word of God so pastors feed and we're going to see in just a minute and lead the flock so what's the primary duty of the leadership to feed and to lead 
we finish verse 2 because he goes on and he's saying, Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking, notice what he says, the oversight thereof. Take the oversight of the flock, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, that's King James for money, okay, but of a ready mind. And so let's look at what Peter is telling the pastors, the elders to do. They're told to feed, and then he tells them that you're also to lead. I want you to feed the flock of God, but I also want you to take the oversight. I want you to watch over them. I want you to provide leadership for them, because that's what a shepherd does. And sheep that have no shepherd go astray. There is no such thing in the New Testament as Christians unconnected with a local congregation that had spiritual leadership. You just don't see it there. You see it today, but you don't see it there because God never intended it to be that way. Now, when times are hard, and, and Peter's talking to people that are having a hard time, it's easy to begin to be self-centered, right? When things are difficult, it's like, well, I'm sorry you're going through that, but I'm going through it too, and it's hurting me more than maybe it's hurting you, or at least I'm feeling it more for me than I feel it for you. And so he's reminding the, the shepherds here, the pastors, don't do that. But spiritual maturity puts the flock as a priority. Okay. For spiritual leadership, the priority is not you. The priority is the flock of God. So he's saying to these elders, listen, times are hard. There's persecution, and because you're the leader, you're going to take the arrows. Okay? They're going to come for you first. But I want you to feed and lead the flock of God because these are the people that Jesus Christ died for. And I want you to care for them. I want you to provide that. I want you to now exhibit maturity. He calls them elders. I want you to, to put your big boy pants on and I want you to do the things that are necessary even though I know and you know it's not easy. So it's not only important what pastors do, but it's also important how they do it. And he gives in that verse two statements uh, two negatives and two positives that he contrasts between there, okay? He says, I want you to do it not by constraint, but willingly. In other words, I don't want you to lead forcefully because they're sheep. And you don't, lead, you don't drive sheep like cattle, right? You've never seen a shepherd on the back of a horse saying, ha, 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 and a bunch of sheep going through there. Because you don't do that for sheep. They would just, they'd just scatter all over the place. And so he says, is that, is this I want you to do, I want you to lead, and they follow you. So I said, this is what I want you to do. I want you to lead, not by forcefully. I don't want you to go there with a whip and, you know, whipping the sheep into, into their place. But I want you to lead, direct lead. And I said, and again, he then says, I don't do it for filthy lucre. Don't do it for, for monetary gains for yourself, but of a ready mind. I don't want it just to be about you. Okay? So, so, so your leading and your caring for the sheep isn't about what you're going to get out of it. I, I, I want you to be focused on what God wants for them. And when things are difficult, again, that can be pretty hard. So it really goes back to saying, leaders, check your motives. What is your motivation? It is easy to serve selflessly when you're appreciated and you're rewarded. When people are appreciating you, when people are going up to you and say, man, I appreciate you. Thank, we thank God that you're, you're our leader. Man, we, we're so, and, and when they reward you and they go, hey, you know, it's your birthday. We wanted to do something nice for you. Hey, it's your anniversary. We want to do something nice for you. Hey, it, we just appreciate you, so we want to do something. It's easy to be selfless in that thing, but it's also hard when, when, People, you know, when things are hard for them, they tend to do what everybody does, and they're just focused on them. And so they come to you, and they're not like, well, Pastor, what, what are you going through? Let me just tell you how hard things are for me. 
And let me tell you how, how I, I know you're going, you got a hard job, but really, you only work one day a week, and so it can't be that bad or whatever. And so, so, so let me just tell you how hard and difficult it is, it is for me or whatever. And, and so Peter's taking this all in, and he's saying, listen, I, I want you to understand that you've got to have the right attitude. It's not what you get out of ministry. It's what you put into it. And then he goes on a little bit further, next verse, verse 3, and he says this, Neither being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. Okay. Peter says, listen guys, I don't want you to be lords over God's heritage. Church leaders, they ought to be respected, they ought to be honored, but they have to remember that they are to serve in humility that the church belongs to Jesus. It's, it's Jesus' church. It's the flock of God. It's His heritage, not your heritage. It's God's heritage. It's God's flock. It's His church. And what I'm telling you to do is to be an example or an example to the flock. I want you to, to, for leaders to model servant leadership to model servant leadership. And that's oftentimes a hard thing to do. But he says, I want you to model that. I want you to be a servant, first of all. And I believe that's what he's called us to do. And I've tried, I've strived in my ministry to practice that in the sense that I will never ask you to do something that I'm not personally willing to do. If I ask you to give towards a cause, I'm going to give towards the cause. Okay. If I ask you to show up and go, and go with us on this outreach activity, then I'm going to do that. I'm never going to ask you to do something that I'm not personally willing to do. Now, obviously, none of us can do everything all the time at the same time. Okay? But we ought, we ought to do, be, in, be an example. And so he says to, to the elders here, listen, I want you not just to talk about what's good. I want you to do what's good. I don't want you just to tell people what they ought to be doing. I want you to be leading them in what they're doing. And, and uh, I have a picture in my office that, that kind of typifies this. Um, this is a scene uh, that took place. In, uh, during the Civil War, this is take, takes place in the Battle of Little Round Top. Now, in the Battle of Gettysburg on the second day, um, not too far from the battlefield are these series of hills. One was Big Round Top and one was Little Round Top. And on the battlefield of Little Round Top, you had the Union troops on, on the high ground and you had the Confederate troops on, on the low ground making an advance up to... Uh, to, to, the, to the Union troops. And on that particular battle, the Union troops were, were um, positioned there. They had the 20th Maine that was leaded, led by uh, Colonel Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain. And then um, below, making the advance, you had uh, several divisions from Alabama that were making this, division, this uh, uh, attack. Well, after repeated volleys back and forth, the Union began to run out of ammunition. And at some point, they, they had no ammunition. But the orders that they were given to the colonel was, under no circumstances can you retreat. You must hold to the last. And so finally, when they were out of ammunition, Colonel Chamberlain decided to make the bold statement of leading his men in a bayonet charge. Instead of just telling them to go and watching from behind, he took the leader, lead role in charging into the troops with no, no ammunition. Well, this move so shocked the, the Confederate troops that they were routed and it stopped the, the advancement. Uh, later, Chamberlain was given the Medal of Honor for his bravery there. But it shows and demonstrates the various th importance that leadership is not just about telling people what to do. And we kind of think about it. If I'm the leader, I get to tell people what to do. It's not always about that. It's also leading them in what they should do. And that's, again, the, the message that Peter's trying to give across from leadership. Whether we're talking about pastors, whether we're talking about deacons, whether we're talking about teachers, whether we're talking about husbands and wives, whether we're talking about whoever, we ought to be setting the example. Pastors are to lead and to feed. 
Okay, we're to, we're to lead people, we're to feed them the word of God. And, and I think of Jesus, of course, as the great, great example of this, isn't he? I mean, time and time again, Jesus served people. He, his favorite term for himself was the son of man. And we saw, um, and, and on Wednesdays, Don and I are teaching through John. We're in John 13. We're going to see this, this situation where Jesus is now getting ready for the Lord's Supper. And prior to that, there, Jesus comes and he models servitude as Jesus is there. And the disciples are all enamored with themselves. Who's going to do this? And nobody wants to take the uh, position of washing feet. And I get it. I mean, nobody wants to be a foot washer. There's certain things in the church nobody wants to do, you know. We ask, hey, can you help uh, set up these tables? And you're like, oh, I got a bad back, or, or suddenly my knee hurts, or, you know, I remember I got something in the oven. You know, we, there's certain things we just don't want to do, and, and, and that was one of them. And so Jesus realizes, well, nobody wants to do it, so Jesus himself starts washing the feet of the disciples. Jesus didn't just talk about servitude. Jesus didn't just talk about leadership in, by serving. He modeled it. He, he put it on. He wore it. And, and so Peter is reminding us that. Because Peter was there. Keep in mind, Peter sat there. And, and, and we won't get into it because we're going to get into it probably on Wednesday. The little diatribe with Peter and Jesus there. So if you want to know more about it, then come Wednesday, 7 o'clock. We'd love for you to, to be a, a part of that as well. Um, verse 4. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. One day the chief shepherd's going to appear. He's coming back, as we sang in our, our last song. He's coming back again. And Peter reminds us that these elders, these pastors, these under shepherds, are accountable to the chief shepherd. They're, they're not on their own. There's a, there's a day, there's an accountability that's going to come that one day that chief shepherd's going to appear and you that are in positions of leadership, you're going to not only have to answer for yourself, you're going to have to answer for how you fed and led. And so there's a kind of a sobering thought that's there. Okay? That one day they're going to give an account. And if you've been faithful, if you've done what you're supposed to do, you'll get the reward then. Now, you may not get your reward in this life, but one day you'll be rewarded for that. And the truth of the matter is, as we consider all that, one day both the shepherd, the pastor, and the sheep, all of us one day are going to come before Jesus and have to give an account for what we did. Every one of us will. You'll have to give an account for what you did as a sheep. Did you take the food that was given you? Did you follow the leadership that was there? Did you portray the right attitude? Did you encourage the shepherd? What did you do? You're going to be accountable for that. Now, you're not accountable for what the shepherd does, but you are accountable for what you do. And likewise, the shepherd's not accountable for what you do, but he is accountable for what he does. Leaders are accountable. And one day, all of us will have to give an account and answer to God for what we do. And Peter reminds us of that. He reminds us of that. The writer of Hebrews kind of echoes this in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 17. And, and here are the words that the writer of Hebrews says to us. Obey them that have the rule over you. Submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, as they must give an account that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. Listen, the, the leaders God puts in front of us are there to, to guide and to feed us. And one day they're going to have to give an account to God for what they did. But he says, here's your command. I want you to obey. I want you to submit. Why? Because God wants their task of feeding and leading to be joyful. Joyful. Not to be endured, but to be enjoyed. We sometimes get those E words back and back, backwards, you know. We think, yeah, I'm enduring to the end. And Jesus says, I want you to enjoy it. I, I've come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly in John 10. 10. So, so we kind of miss the, the, the whole dynamic that's there. 
Listen, they're watching for your souls. They're not there. They're not supposed to be there to, 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 to lord it over. He just reminded them, hey, don't be lords over that. But at the same time, I want you to provide some leadership. I want you to say certain things are right, certain things are wrong. I want you to model that as much as possible to them. I want you to care for them. I want you to give them the food. Because pastors lead and feed the flock. You know, much has changed over the 2,000 years that the church has existed. And should the Lord Jesus tarry longer, I fully expect that the church is going to change even more so. That's not unusual. That's, that's just the way it is. But one thing that must not change and should not change is biblical servant leadership in the church. So let me close by suggesting how we might apply this this week as we go about. So I'd encourage you to do this for, for that because your church leadership needs some things from you. First of all, we need your prayers. We need you to pray. Do you pray for your church leaders? Maybe if we prayed for our church leaders, we'd have better church leaders. Don't know. Be patient with your church leaders. It's not easy. We want people to be patient with us. I want people to be patient with me. And yet sometimes I can be incredibly impatient. And so a little patient goes a long way. They need your participation. Because the leader can't do everything. Okay? There's a lot that needs to be done. And one person can't do it all. One person's not possible to do it all. Your leaders do not have all the same spiritual gifts. If you look to me to fulfill all your spiritual needs, I'm going to disappoint you because I don't have all the spiritual gifts. I have a few, but I don't have all of them. And that's where you come in. You have gifts that I don't have, and we need your participation. We need you to do more than warm a pew, okay, and drop a few shekels into the offering box. Those are good. Do that. But we need you to do what you can do. You say, well, I can't do much. But what could you do? Could you make a phone call? Could you make a visit? Could you cut out some you know, stuff for children's church? Could you, could you, you know, whatever. I mean, you could probably do something. Okay? And so be involved in participation. And then we need your praise from time to time. Sometimes everybody needs a little encouragement. Everybody needs a, hey, you know, some of you would die. You would just drop dead if you went up to your, your Sunday school teacher and said, hey, that was a great lesson. They, or they would. They would just fall over dead. They'd go, oh, you know, I can't believe you said that, you know. Um, and, and, and it's funny. We, we do this. If you go to a restaurant and you get really bad service, then you complain. You know, you write that nasty letter or you talk to the manager or something. But when they do a really good job, you just kind of go, yeah, good, and you kind of leave. And, 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 and the same is true with the church, that everybody needs to, to get a little bit of feedback to know, hey, you did a good thing. Not, not insincere, but sincerity. When somebody does a really good job or whatever, they, they need that, that kind of feedback that, hey, they're, do, they're doing good. It's okay to tell them when they mess up, but some of you, that's the only time you tell them is when they mess up. You know, I just want to let you know this didn't go right. I'm going to let you know you messed this up. And I'm going to let you, you know, and it's like, okay, that's great. But also when they get it right and, you know, give them at least a thumbs up now and then, okay? So your church leadership needs those things. I pray that you'll take it to heart this week. You know, it, it, ministry is always hard. But when things are really difficult, when things aren't going right, when, when you're facing some obstacles that are, that are making it hard to do what you're supposed to do, that's when we need to be mature. That's when I need to be mature. That's when you need to show some maturity there. Nobody displayed that kind of leadership any better than Jesus did. And we can look at examples and examples. And though he was fully God, I mean, he was God in the flesh. Jesus could stand there and say, I'm not going to serve you. You serve me. Bow down before me. I'm the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He could have done that. And yet Jesus never portrayed himself that way. He never walked into a groom and said, hey, why aren't you kneeling? Why didn't you genuflex in front of me? What's up with that? You know. When they called him Jesus, he didn't say, excuse me, I, this is, I'm Jesus the Christ, get it right, you know, you know. 
He, he didn't do any of that. Why? He, he was comfortable with who he was, but he also led in a, in a humble servant demeanor without advocating his authority. His service never conflicted with his authority. Great leaders are great servants. And if you're not a servant, you're not a great leader. Because you know, great leaders aren't just about telling people what they ought to do and what they did wrong. It's demonstrating that as well. And if there was one place that I could lead people, it would be to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. If there was one place I could take people and lead them to, would be to the foot of the cross. There's no more important place than that. There's no more important thing than that. And that's a difficult thing to lead people to because in order to follow, in order to do that, you have to drop your pride. You have to drop your goodness. You have to drop your religion. You have to drop your works. And you have to fall before the cross of Jesus. But if, when you do that, you see a Savior who died for your sins. Your sins. He died for your sins. He took your punishment that you should have received. But he rose again. And he offers forgiveness to those who are willing to receive his finished work. And so today, if you're willing to repent and receive the grace of God, your sins can be forgiven. I pray that you'd follow me to the cross of Jesus. You'd follow me there where there's mercy, there's grace, and there's love beyond comprehension. So much to say. What a wonderful Savior we have. Let's pray together as we close. What a Savior. How magnificent you are, Lord. How gracious and powerful. How amazing. Thank you for the example that you portrayed to us throughout your life here on earth and help us to exhibit that kind of maturity as we seek to follow you and to lead others in following us as we follow you. Times are hard right now, Lord. Many people are dealing with situations in their lives and homes that they've never had to deal with before. Our church is no exception, Lord. We have lots of people that are out because of various reasons. And Lord, over the, the past couple years, we have uh, diminished in so many different ways. And, and so many times, Lord, we find ourselves struggling. But we're here to follow you. And help us to keep our eyes on you. And please, Lord, make this message a part of our heart. May we take it and use it for your glory. Because I ask this in the name of that's truly above all names, the name of Jesus. Amen and amen.